This episode is powered by denmeditation.com. The meditation is the primary focus. The bigger goal is for people to understand and love themselves, thus creating more harmony in the community at large. To find out more about Den Meditation's teacher training programs, retreats, and all things Den Meditation, go to denmeditation.com. I am so pleased to have Paul Selig back today. He's been on a few times. So I do recommend after you listen to this, if you've not listened to past or previous episodes, go for it because obviously we cover so much. He has now written 10 books. He is a channeler. He channels and his guides, I say, are very prolific. (laughs) So this is book number 10, Resurrection. We have spoken about other material in the past. Plus, we probably dive into his personal life more in the past. So if you want to know about him, definitely go check out episode one. But what I love about today's episode is separation and fear and how as a society, we are actually being called and stepping up. We have, we have the invitation to step up vibrationally, but how do you do that? And we talk about that in this episode, how you can do it, how you can step out of fear, how you can actually have trauma in your past, have anger in your past, have horrible things happen in your past, but reclaim them to a different vibration. Ooh, and one more thing before I forget, definitely listen to this whole episode because in the middle of this episode, we are giving you guys a code for a discount for an event he has tomorrow, a fully channeled event. So listen, code dropped in the middle of the episode. I love having you on, obviously. I love the 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 pace of which you can put out books. I know it's channeled. I get it. It's unbelievable. <laughs> It's incredible, but the material is always so good. So nothing makes me happier than to have you on and to talk about everything that you're doing. Um, But I want to start like personally a little bit. We've been starting this season asking people one question using two words. If you could describe yourself in one word from five years ago and then using one word as of today, what would those words be? Two words as I was five years ago. Well, one from five years ago and one from today. And maybe it's the same word. I mean, I would say I was hopeful five years ago, and now I'm relieved. <laughs> I'm relieved. It's not the struggle that it used to be. Things have changed so much. And I feel most of the time enormous gratitude and relief for the passage that I've, I've undergone. Um, and a lot of it, I think, has been the work that's been coming through. I think I was a resistant student to it myself in some ways. My challenge has always been that I'm the one dictating the books. I mean, how does this, why is this happening through me? If you were doing it, I would have had an easier time right. with the material, but, um, but it took hold and I'm glad it did. So is that why, so when you use the word relief, is that because you feel like you've accepted your role a little bit more? I think that's part of it. You know, I, I, I was, I've always been fascinated by this work. I didn't really choose it. I wasn't expecting it, but I've stuck with it and I've stayed with it because I find the whole process still somewhat baffling and and extraordinary, you know, at the same time. And I suspect the relief is, is that it's, it's my life feels more integrated. You know, when the books first started coming, I was still teaching college and been doing that for many, many, many years. And I was very reluctant to be known for, for this work. You know, I initially had a website without my name or my photograph on it. You know, you <laughs> had a password to, to find me if you wanted an appointment. And so I feel like some of it's just plain old integration and some of it's, um, you know, have, having had the courage, I suspect, to step out of what I knew and what I counted on and who I thought I was supposed to be in the world to show up for what's actually here. And, and I'm, I'm happy about it. I love that. And it's so interesting because that's a lot of what I feel like, you know, resurrection, like this book is about, which is kind of about letting go of all those preconceived notions and things from the past Mm -hmm. to step into who you are. So did you find, it's interesting talking about how your reluctance and our relief, have you found the vibrations changing in you as you download it? Like, has the relationship with the channeling changed? Well, I mean, I'm always surprised every time they complete a book 
and I think Resurrection's the tenth. That's of, insane. Of yeah, and there's another one ready, you know, that'll be out in the fall. Um, every time they complete a book, and this has really been the case since the very first book, I think, well, that's it. There's nothing else for them to say. And then there is, and it's coherent, and I'm surprised, but it's always sort of an up-leveling and a deepening mm -hmm. of the understanding. The energy of each book is palpable. I mean, if you, if you can, you know, it, it, it's, it'll rock you a bit. So there's always a process of integration after the book is channeled, um, because the energy is running through the dictation. The first time I actually really read the book, is when I'm doing the audio recordings because I have to sit in a chair and read the, read the transcripts. And when I'm channeling, I retain maybe a third hmm. of what's coming through. But the energy I feel, and yeah, I do think it's um, my experience of life, I always feel is in most ways equivalent to, to co-resonance, which is, you know, the consciousness you hold claims a reality that you move into accordance with, you know, higher and lower, and as they say, high, low, and in between. Mm -hmm. And so it's all opportunity. So yes, that has been my experience. So if you're, if the first time you're reading it is while you're actually doing the audio book, I find one of my favorite things that has nothing to do with the material. I giggle every time you mention how they're talking about you, where they're like, either we have to pause for him, or he's very limited, we can only do so much, or... I, he, there was one in this one that made me laugh out loud where it was like, he's interrupting us. We really wish he wouldn't. <laughs> and is it funny for you to see that if you're not? It's uh, No, because when it's happening, there's always a reason for it. You know, I, I have all these books that have my name on the cover that I didn't write. Mm -hmm. I, I do consider myself at this point a collaborator because I'm present and they're working through me to deliver stuff. But if they say something that I have a hard time with, um, or if there's an instruction that I find challenging, I've been known to interrupt. And from the very beginning, you know, I've done that. Um, in the very first book, which was called I Am The Word, mm -hmm. this is, you know, I think it was even in the first session when I didn't even know it was going to be a book. You know, they were saying, we're preparing you for this book. And that first discussion is in the book. But there's an odd moment where they say, this is not a book that's been written before. This is not A Course in Miracles. And all these people wrote it and said, why are your guides talking about A Course in Miracles? Well, it was because I interrupted the channeling. They said, this is not a book that's been written before. I said, oh, what about A Course in Miracles? And they said, this is not that. <laughs> so they've come up with a, a system, I think, really, of either anticipating my interruptions before I derail their dictation because a few times I think it has sort of derailed their intention for a chapter because I moved them into an explanation that they didn't feel that they required. Um, and they're also pretty good about saying, you know, Paul is interrupting and, and that allows me to continue with a level of comfort. Once in a while, they'll say, Paul is interrupting. We are not taking his question until later, which I, I think is my favorite thing they say, because it reminds me that they're in charge and it's their agenda. It's not mine. But know? it is fun because like, obviously there's so much incredible material and we'll get more into that, but there, it adds like the personal part of what's really happening, which is a dance with you guys as well. I mean, like you said, it's a collaboration yeah. and it's such a beautiful reminder that that's what's happening. Frankly, I also have always found in all the books that your questions are actually very helpful. Yeah. And I've always wondered, because have you ever asked them why they chose you? Well, yes and no. I mean, they've, they've, they've spoken to it. Occasionally people ask, they say that I agree to this, you know, uh, on, on a level, I agree to this. I've worked with them before and this is mm. a, an ongoing relationship. Um, when I was in my early thirties and so that's 30 years ago now, and I was studying energy healing and I was working with this teacher who I respected and, um, I was doing a class with her once and she said, okay, everybody write one thing down on a paper. This is an important prayer I'm going to give you when it's going to, it's going to happen. So be careful what you write. Mm. 
And I, at that moment in my life, was have I, I had had just enough experience of God, for lack of a better word, whatever you wanted to call it, I, whatever it was, I knew it was real. I knew there was something more. And this was after having been raised pretty much an atheist much of my life. And I wrote in my little thing something to the effect of, I want to go all the way with this. Mm. Which in some ways I think was a highly, I won't say arrogant request, but I, I thought if this is real and I believe it is, I, I want to go all the way where as far as I can go. And sometimes I think in retrospect that the books are an answer to that prayer. It's a way mm. to go forward. You know, they say you become the doorway through these teachings. And what I was looking for in those days was the doorway. There was a point in one of the books where they said, you know, or it wasn't even in a book, it was in a private session with somebody who was asking me questions for the guides because I can't always do it without somebody there. And, um, and I was unhappy. And they said, well, you know, Paul's job is to hold the door open for others. And I was aghast at that, you know, and she wasn't happy either. But then later they invited me through the door, you know, and then they say, you become the doorway. You all become the doorway to the higher octave through your presence in being. So why me? I guess I said yes, finally, or maybe I asked. Um, I didn't ask to be a channel because I didn't really believe in it that much. I'm still somewhat cautious around some stuff that is called channeling. And um, I think that I tend to make a real distinction between inspiration and channeling um, and wishful thinking and inspiration. You know, and I think all of these things have places. But Talk about that a little bit more, the differentiation between that and channeling. Well, the books that come through me are unedited. So maybe there are three words out of 300 pages of manuscript that are, that are changed. And usually because I mispronounced them or I was speaking so fast that I inverted an end into the, the end as opposed to end the, you know, because I'm just trying to keep up. Yeah. Um, once in a while, they'll use a word that I don't know. I know it's a word, but I don't know what it means. And I stumble. Um, but three words I would say is about right for what gets altered. Inspiration, and so it's channeled, it's dictation, it's stenography. I don't think it's, it's more than that. I think I'm a good stenographer that has been developed at this level. When I'm reading psychically or when I'm working psychically, there's interpretation involved, which is different. So if I tune into you and I go, mm -mm, and I go, boy, she feels angry, I'm interpreting what it feels like. And then I'm getting language to support an understanding of what's happening. So inspiration is incredible because all great art is inspired art, I believe, you know. And, but the difference is I think inspiration allows you to go back and edit and craft you know, um, and I don't do that. And my feeling is, you know, it's not my book to edit. It's right. not my, it's not my teaching. You know, I'm not the teacher. I don't pretend to be the teacher. I can interpret the teachings better at this point than I used to be able to. And that's just because there's been so, so much of it. Um, but I don't want to show up and be the one with the answers personally. It's not my job. So when I work as an inspired uh, reader or a psychic reader, whatever you want to call it, I'm relying my own memories, used my own experience. I'm, I'm referencing through my common experience. The guides may rely on some of my history or experience that Paul will remember or when Paul was young, he believed like that, but it's somewhat different. One is a struggle to find the language to explain something when I'm channeling. That's just not the issue. All I do is dictate, you know. Did it ever feel intrusive? Like how you just said they might use your past or your history to be like, he can relate because of X, Y, and Z. It, yes and no. I mean, I don't think I've ever felt like exposed. Well, may I? Yeah, I think I have felt exposed, but I haven't felt embarrassed. They're loving. And they, you know, there's no humiliation. I have discovered over the years because I, you know, people think, wow, are you doing this all day long? I mean, if I can 
tune in. But if I'm hearing something that I don't want to hear, I'm going to turn the station. I don't want to listen to this. You know, if I'm doing the dishes, leave me alone. So it's not intrusive. It's free will is involved. They don't override my free will. Um, when I get support from them personally, it's usually in the present moment because they're, they're pretty good with um, not supporting me and taking actions based in fear. So I will get counsel at that level, but I'm not getting the big stuff from myself. So when they have the opportunity to speak to me, and it's usually when I'm doing a book dictation or a public channeling, and there is something that they need to say to me, they will do it publicly because I'm the rule is I'm not going to shut them up because I can't. There's, you know, 500 people there. Ah. And but it's, it's never been terrible. There's one book that they channeled when I was really melting down through much of it. It was called Alchemy. Mm. And I couldn't believe when that book was put together that it made sense. It's a really interesting and good book. But it came when my world, my emotional and psychic world, were really being rocked. And they were supporting me through that mm. because, I mean, when you're like on the verge of tears and you have to sit down and channel and they're going to address your stuff in some way, it was, it was interesting and it was useful and hopefully helpful because it's really not a book that's about me or personal to me. Um, but again, I, I don't think they've ever. I've never felt shamed by them, certainly, and I've never heard them do that to anybody else. I mean, it's so interesting because, you know, one of the things, and we'll get into the material, one of the things they talk about in this book also is just, you know, the idea of even just praying a little bit more and talking, you know, starting mm -hmm. your morning with a connection to just knowing there's more. So, you know, they use the word God a lot. Um, so for those who are listening, if that bothers you, just know it's the vibration, it's source, it's universe, yeah. it's... Um, and they were saying, like, if you can just start your morning with just a simple even acknowledgement or connection or prayer, it will ch it will just change your day and just how you perceive things immensely. And mm -hmm. so it's like interesting how you through the years now with these guides have this support system around you that you cannot deny. So you're automatically communicating and it's probably and it's shifted you into that whether you wanted to or not. Yes and no. I mean, I agree with you, yes. But when I'm in my stuff, I'm in my stuff, and I'm not going to want to hear it necessarily. You know, <laughs> it's like about. your parents. You're like, you don't know. <laughs> yeah, if I want to know. But if I want to die now, they talked about this in a lecture yesterday, actually. It's like, well, you know, about why we lower our vibration and where it's often just really a choice, which is I want to have my snit. I want to have my tantrum. I want to have my experience of fear because, and, and, and they say, in, in, in my case, it's what I've known. Right. So it's a place that I revert to because there's an odd kind of comfort. perverse comfort in it. Yeah. You know, but I don't have to. And the reminder that it's choice is a big one, you know. It's so interesting because I was just having this conversation the other day as a parent um, you know, I feel like sometimes our best teachers are our kids just because they trigger you. It's like they bring up everything you feel like you've somehow worked through and you're like, oh God, I have not worked through that clearly. Yeah. And it's funny. I am my most impatient and it's like this bitchy, spoiled brat kid like is living inside of me when my really amazing child, who's actually very kind and great and well-behaved does almost nothing, but it's amazing how it will trigger me. And I was just talking and it's like, and because, you know, I'm familiar with material like this and stuff, I know it's a choice. And it's amazing though, how when something, and they talk a little bit about this, about, you know, kind of the splinters you have in your past and stuff, but it's amazing how sometimes there's so many cords to parts of your own history that are so embedded in you that even though you have the choice you wish it were as simple as being like, hey, do I want to choose to be like this or not be like this? And even though my head's saying, do not be like this, you know what you're doing. It's like that feeling and that vibration sometimes wins out. Yeah, it does. You know, it does. What they're teaching now or what the, the book that's coming out next really addresses is the idea of memory and that because we've been living in an experience of separation, you know, we believe ourselves to be separate from source and each other. 
And because all of our memories are accrued through separation, we're actually reinforcing separation through memory because yes. it's what we've known. And now they're going back and working directly with memory. And it's not to say, they're not saying that things didn't happen and things didn't stink and things weren't awful and hard things didn't happen. But it's sort of re-knowing all this stuff from yes. this perspective, which allows us, they say, not to replicate the past. They say that the personality self you know, the small self, which is there's nothing wrong with it. It's just an aspect of us. It's not who we truly are. But they say the small self knows itself through history. That's all it has. You know, it's all it has is the evidence from history. And if all of that evidence was born in separation, we've been doing the best we can within the context of what they would say is something that's not true. You know, our experiences of separation, but the truth is, is that we're not separate. But we've accrued all this evidence for separation, so we, we expect to replicate it. It's one of my favorite parts, actually, of resurrection, too, when they really get into this idea. Because, I, well, let's talk about it just as a, so people understand as we jump into it, that, you know, it's talking about how, you know, if you want to create and manifest, it's how do you get to a point of remembering, to reclaiming who you are beyond separation and remembering that we've created separation ourselves, which has yeah. ultimately created fear. And mm -hmm. we have to kind of remember that we were all like, you're just saying one and part of source in order to kind of reclaim ourselves fully and elevate our vibration so that we can, you know, create from that place. Um, what I find fascinating, there's two things and we'll jump into it because I really love when they go into kind of reclaiming yourself and your past and, you know, kind of, if you get, if you can live in that higher vibration, how you can clear things. Cause I really do want to get into that. But first, mm -hmm. one of the things they say right off the bat is, and I think it's cause it's the entry to these new teachings is this is happening collectively as a species. You have now chosen that you're willing to see beyond. You're willing to actually see that you're beyond separation and you're willing to actually start making this journey um, kind of to this higher vibration. Can you talk a little bit about what they mean, how we as a species has chosen? I mean, they've been saying it for a couple of years now and I was um, a little surprised and quite relieved when I started hearing this, but they said, you know, they said that it's the, it seems to be the equivalent of a collective soul, you know, the, the, the soul of the species or the agreement of the high at, at a much higher level that we're going to make it, we're going to survive. And part of what I've been told is, you know, we've had the means to blow ourselves up, you know, which we didn't used to have, but we have it now, you know, this idea. And they say that you can build a bigger bomb and the, and the pretext that it's going to keep you safe is ridiculous because eventually they go off. And that we've kind of come to a place where we've realized that futility, that we need to go forward and that we won't extinguish ourselves. That's the essence of what I've heard. But that this passage is deeply uncomfortable because it really does require us moving beyond an investment in separation, an investment in who is right and who is wrong and all of the, you know, the stuff that we've created over time. That it's a challenge. I mean, they've said it's four generations before we See begin to have this other experience, yeah, in a visible sense, which I found interesting. I didn't know this, but I said that to some friends. You know, I had some people visiting who were bemoaning the fate of the world and thinking it's, it's all foregone. We're all going to, and these aren't people that were into my work at all. They're just doing their own thing. And um, they said, "Well, what do your guides say, Paul?" And I said, "I told them about the, the four generations, and you know, they both said, oh my God, that's like Moses.'" leading mm. the Jews out for 40 years. It took them 40 years to forget that they had been slaves. It took 40 years to forget. And maybe in this case, it's to forget the investment in separation that has been so, so definitive, I think, for almost all of us. 
And that's what I thought was fascinating is when they were pointing out, because look, in a broad scope, I think a lot of people and most people probably listening to this podcast are like, I get it. I get it. We're all one. We're all from the same source. But when they really got into it, you're like, oh shit. Like you realize how ingrained you are in the separation. So to the point when they were saying things like, even when you think you know what's right, like, you know, even when you think you know what justice is or what's right or wrong, just by deciding that you alone are being part of separation, like just the injustice of it all. And that, you know, even if you feel like you're doing the right thing and you're stepping above, or my favorite was when they got into, like, you may say, I would, you know, if the rule, if you wouldn't, if, if nobody would catch you, would you kill someone? Or if it was okay to kill someone, would you? Or if you knew that there was, you wouldn't go to jail and nothing would be wrong, would you steal? And they were saying like, of course you want to say no, because I know better and I wouldn't. And they were saying, but that alone is separation because you're pretending that you are better than the opposite version of doing that. And you're not actually reclaiming your entire self, which is the possibility of doing all of it. Mm -hmm. And that's when I was like, wow, the work is deep. Like it's harder than I think people realize because it's so intrinsically wound within us. Well, I've always said there's nothing convenient about these teachings. It's why I'm probably <laughs> not going to be channeling on cruise ships, you know. Work, <laughs> but it's you know, I don't know. I, I, you know, there are places in my life where I'm going. Why don't I have a partner? Why don't I have this? But pretty much every area that I've allowed to to go has worked out really well now. And I've stopped operating in some ways from this place of demanding how things should be, because my idea of how things should be are based in inherited ideas of what it means to be this or that, what it means to be successful, what it means to be happy, you know, and, and it's a different way of operating than I, I knew. One of the things, and it's a simple thing, they teach some simple, simple, simple stuff that, that's easy to enact. They say, who you damn and what you damn damns you back. And that's just a teaching of co-resonance. That's all that is, you know. It's like who you put in darkness calls you to that darkness. Or what you put in darkness calls you to the darkness. Basically, you can't be the light and hold another in darkness. And they've said again and again, and often to me, because I can get on my high horse, you know, they say, you know, self-righteousness is always the small self. Mm. And then I go, oh, brother, okay. Now, that doesn't mean that I have to agree with other people's behavior or action or beliefs. I don't. But the moment I'm intent on making myself right at the cost of somebody else being wrong, I'm back in the soup. You know, and, and it's not a happy place to be. The convenience of being right doesn't last for very long. You know, finally, it's about how we show up in the world and how we, I expect, treat everybody. I mean, they said in this book, what was it? You might remember, maybe not. Like, you were right, like, maybe 5% of the time or something. They were like, you're actually never right, is what they were saying, right? I remember the exact line. Uh, it's, it's something like that, yeah. And yeah. you're like, wait, really? Come on. Like, you're thinking about and then you start, and then you get into it, and you hear what they're saying, and I think they go into a little bit what I was saying before as – you know, a lot of times we choose to be right, but it's putting us in, you know, again, separation. And it's, and it goes, I think it was like Marianne Williamson, speaking of course of miracles, who said a long time ago, like, do you want to be right? Or do you want to be happy? It's alluding yeah. to kind of what you were saying, which is it help, it really does allow you to think. And I even know, and even though they were very clear in these teachings, this is experiential, it is not about the mind. It does help sometimes we've got this mind that can be really yeah. bothersome and it did allow me to really think about what does right mean and and what am i gaining by being right and even when i think like you were saying it's like a high horse thing or i feel like it's even a morality or an ethical thing like what does that mean and it begs a lot of questions but it really it gets you thinking well you know the guides have said for a long time what is true is always true 
And so they're not that big on saying my truth is my truth is that, mm-hmm. you know, because that's still subjective. You know, my experience. So you're going to say, well, that's not your truth. That's your experience or your opinion, you know, and it, it's right for you. But they say what is true is always true. And that's actually helpful for me sometimes because the difference between what is true and what is, quote unquote, right can be somewhat different. And we're doing the best we can. I mean, when people believe that the world was flat, which wasn't all that long ago, and I'm sure there's still people that think that, but that was the frame that they operated with, and they were all operating as if that's what was true, you know, or right. I mean, women hadn't, haven't had the vote for very long. Everybody was assuming that was right until the consciousness was altered. So what we think is true or what we think is right may be vastly different than what is. And if you think, and I'm just guessing here, you know, that our understanding of how the world is all put together and what makes us us and all of those things is is born through a belief in separation and informed by thousands of years of, you know, religious information and misinformation, and all of those things, you know, there may be something that's far different than we've experienced yet, that perhaps we can. You know, I, when I started to develop psychically, I, I'd had experiences when I was a child that were specific, just a, a three, three, three of them, maybe four. Um, but I never would have thought of myself as psychic. It wasn't how I operated at all. I was too busy, you know, getting drunk when I was a kid. Um, so refreshing to hear, by the way. <laughs> no, it's true. I was a mess. And um, it's when I got sober, <clears throat> when I was 25, that I began to open up psychically once I stopped sort of self-medicating. And it happened, it coincided with this new awareness of God, or I'd started praying, which is why things changed. I mean, that was it. And I'd never prayed before, but I started doing it because I, I was in trouble. Although I couldn't necessarily name the trouble. But when the psychic stuff started, I didn't have context for it. It's not that I was frightened. I just didn't have context. It wasn't supposed to be available to me, you know. And I went to people, I said, why am I seeing these lights around people? And why am I feeling in my body, what's going on with the person sitting next to me on the subway, you know, I mean, what's happening. And I was fortunate to have enough people show up at the right time to give me some context. So I didn't think I was completely nuts, although I'm sure people did, because I already was releasing the life that I thought I was supposed to have. I just, you know, I didn't know what that was anymore. So, you know, I think that there's so much more that we don't know you know, that we all have capacity for. I really do think that's true. I don't know if we have to run around trying to find it. I think that we can lift our consciousness, our vibration to a level where those things become apparent because they exist. You know, we're the ones in some ways obstructing our experience of the divine. I mean, exactly. I feel like it's interesting when you talk about that lifting your vibration, it's almost like that gives you the view. It's like you can't yeah, see it from down here. Um, yeah. I mean, it is, it's so interesting because they, you know, you keep talking about like letting go of this part of me. And that's a big part of this book too, is being okay. Tra- oh, there's, there's your dog. Really? Yeah. Being okay, transforming and being, you know, okay. It's funny because you started saying you can, in the beginning of the conversation, you were saying when you read these books there, you can feel the vibration. Yeah. This one they, I felt them in all of them when I've read them. There was something about this one that like, I literally the whole time was like, zzzz. and then when I would take pauses to like, since obviously I'm not with you, but when I would take pauses to like read the parts that were kind of like their, I don't know a way to say it, prayers, like have mantras, how would you describe what those claim? They call them claims of truth, claims of truth. And so I would take the time. It was like, it was crazy how strong it was. I was like, oh my God, the, this book is on fire. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, and, the, you know, part of it, one of it is when they, you talk about how you can, 
you know, look at all these things in your past, because as you were talking about, it's not that your past doesn't happen and we can't pretend our past don't happen. And even collectively, we can't pretend the past didn't happen, like the wars or the famines or, you know, COVID at one point when we look backwards. Um, and so it's like, but how can we not let that vibration of what it was, that fear or that separation of what it became, continue being who we are today and continue creating and living from that vibration? And I love how through that truth that they gave us, and it was, behold, I make all things new. Yeah. Yeah. And you were saying there's simple things. That to me was crazy. This idea of kind of being able to raise, you have to kind of raise that vibration and then be able to hold yourself in its entirely and say, like, basically, from this point on, it's new. The, the past exists, but the vibrations are not what's driving me forward. Mm -hmm. I found that so powerful. Well, it's a trippy claim, you know. They, I, I've noticed over the years that they'll often use a claim of truth or mention an idea that they will later unpack in fullness. And behold, I make all things new is one of them. I don't know if they're done unpacking it, but it's an alchemical claim. And it's, they say it's not the personality self that does this. It's what they call the monad or the true self or the God within that does this. And so you move to a level of, of acclimation to that vibration. And it's really, they're saying it's done through presence and being. Mm. It, as you show up, I mean, it's basically like this. What the light shines upon is what the light encounters. You know, it's not trying to illumine, it's just doing its thing. And what they say is, you know, if, if this is a teaching that's very much about co-resonance, if you're operating at this level and what you encounter lifts what you encounter to you, they're saying that this is really how a world is made new. You know, it's less through the work of our hands than we would like to think. It's primarily, I think, done through consciousness and then action follows at that point. I mean, I've always said about their books, these aren't self-help books. You know, that's not what they are, but they're, uh, they're teachings on transformation that are vibrational, that are supporting the change that they're speaking to through the equivalency, their relationship with the readers, because they say they sponsor the readers when they work with the texts. I feel like that's why I love these so much because I self-help books are hard for me, but I always resonate with your, your channel texts. Um, so when they're talking about reclaiming kind of, they're basically saying like reclaiming your past, being able to shift the vibration of the past, reclaim the words, reclaim the history. You know, and I thought a lot about how, you know, certain cultures have taken certain words or things that have had a kind of very negative effect and reclaimed it. But it's mm -hmm. almost like you have to go the full way. Um, and they were saying, like, don't let the history, you have to kind of let the history go and move forward. And what it brought up to me tangibly, what's happening in society, and tell me if you feel like what their thoughts are on this, it's like, okay, well, that's fascinating. Because some of the things happening that a lot of us are holding tightly onto is, you know, when people don't want certain histories being taught. Mm -hmm. And it feels very negative because it feels like we're not honoring. Is mm -hmm. there truth to that of not perpetuating the history, but then what do you do? What about these cultures who want to make sure this history is honored because maybe it's not even fully healed yet. So whether it be like black lives matter, or African American studies, or even the Holocaust with like anti-Semitism kind of raging its ugly head these days. And, mm -hmm. you know, people pretending that didn't exist. So where mm -hmm. does it fall on that, you know, with the vibrational, I, mean, I know I, these are I, hard I, questions. No, it's not. It's not so much. I mean, they're good questions. I probably have to ask them. They, they do address this. I know they address this in the Book of Innocence and the one that's coming out next year. And I don't remember what they said, but at the time I went, oh, brother, this might be a hard one to swallow. But what are you going to do? It's how it came out. So what they have said again and again is that it's not about pretending that things didn't happen. It's about how we hold things, I think, in consciousness. You know, my father was a Holocaust survivor when he was in the kinder transport. You know, they got him out in time and his immediate family did. The rest of the family didn't make it. It's a hard thing. I don't know that I will ever find a way to rationalize cruelty or slavery. And the guides were talking about this in, in the last book. 
Um, but they do talk about, I think it's the idea of who is seeing, who is remembering. And I, I don't know. I mean, memory is useful. It's necessary. You know, it, it, you, but this is what they say. You know, you can learn that it's not safe to pick up the hot frying pan, you know, um, without burning yourself. That there are ways to learn and to comprehend without experiencing pain or buying into fear. So I don't know how to answer that. I could try to ask them now, but I don't, we'd probably be here for 45 minutes with me, you know, whispering and repeating, which is how I, I channel. They're saying the idea of history must be understood as idea, as idea. You're not denying what happened. You are not denying what happened, what is being behind it, but what is being renowned is the idea behind it, what created slavery, or what created slavery, what created what we call the Holocaust, what created what you call the Holocaust, which was murder, which was murder and divisive and divisive and about property and about property in many ways, in many ways, when you understand, when you understand that the action of fear, that the action of fear is to create more fear, is to create more fear and fear operates well through division and fear operates well through division you will no longer be party to it you will no longer be party to it when you stop dividing yourselves when you stop dividing yourselves when you realize the inherent divinity at all when you realize the inherent divinity and in all how you perceive the world how you perceive your world and also understand the idea of history and also understand the idea of history because all history really is an idea because all history really is is an idea will become available to you will become available to you and you will learn more and you will learn more at that stage, at that stage, you can even believe, then you can even believe, period, in their same period. Hmm. It's, it's interesting, and you're right, it is tough, but it's, it's how can you, it goes back to, like, how can you take that broader perspective? Well, you know, they talk about the upper room in this, in all these books. Mm -hmm. And they, all they say is the upper room is the level of vibration above the common field. It's the next octave. They say everything is in music, everything is in tone. And what they're doing is they're transposing us or the energetic system to be able to operate in the higher octave. And they say in the higher octave, fear actually isn't present. It doesn't express there. And when they do workshops and they lift people to the upper room, they'll often say, what, what, are, you, what are you frightened of? People look around like nothing. Right. It's not there. They have to go back downstairs, go back down to the lower to have that experience. And I suspect what, they, what they're saying is that from the higher vantage point, you can reclaim everything. You can re-know or re-see. Because everything finally is idea. You know, I mean, that's the crazy thing. Our idea of what is or what was or what should be, these are ideas. And when they're not being informed by fear, I think our level of comprehension shifts and we're no longer entrenched in replicating the old, if that makes any sense. Yeah, and it, it, it totally makes sense. And I think it goes back to what you said earlier, which it's also... It's who is creating the idea then. So it's from what vibration is it being created? So Absolutely. if you're on that higher vibration, looking at, it, you know, recreating what the idea is versus the lower vibration, it's two very different things. Yeah, they are. And we buy into the lower and then we, we amplify it, you know. Um, I mean, it's hard. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm not immune. I have my bias, you know, I, you know. There, there are things that I would like to see gone in the world in ways that we treat one another that I wish were gone and no longer operative. Um, but I do understand that how I hold anything in consciousness contributes to the form of what is. And that's interesting, you know, it's, it goes back to the simple idea of what you put in darkness calls you to that darkness, which is vibrational accord. And then we end up contributing to the very thing that we say we don't want to see, what you damn, damns you back. In other words, when they say what you bless blesses you in return, they're pretty clear about what that means. It's not like what you hear after a mass shooting, well, blessings and prayers, as if it's a dismissal, you know. Um, they say when you bless something, you're bringing the presence of source upon where it has been denied. You're reclaiming the inherent divinity where it has been denied. 
Their books state again and again and again that the only real challenge humanity is facing is what they call the denial of the divine, which plays out through fear and separation and all of those things in famine and racism, homophobia, all this stuff is all fear, you know, in one way or another. And it's hard to get out of because through that separation, it plays in that lower vibration, which is constantly convincing us that separation exactly. exists. Yes, yeah. yeah, so exactly. It's, right. So you're in this cycle and it, it's really hard to elevate out of it. It was also interesting because they were saying how, you know, fear replicates itself. Yeah. So it's almost as if like you're thinking of it in like scientific terms. It's like this virus grows faster than the other one. The other one's strong, really yeah. strong and can overtake it all. But like it, this proliferates. <laughs> What they've said, though, also, because um, they say fear operates like that. The action of fear is to claim more fear. They say, look at any choice you've ever made in your life that was chosen in fear. See what it got you. More than likely, you're going to see you got more fear. And that either the, so fear has its own trajectory. But they say fear isn't wise. Fear doesn't ascend. Fear stays. basically stays static. It stays at that level. So the way to address this is to lift beyond fear. And then they say you can lift it. You can reclaim what was put in darkness. You can reclaim the event, the person. And that's a re-knowing. What they're talking about now, which gets a little too trippy for me, is how this impacts matter. Because they're saying it actually does. It's not platitude. You know, it's yep. that if you're holding something in, in high consciousness, you're actually altering it. You're lifting it to its true nature. Because I you're literally not, just got chills through my whole body when you said that. You're not denying mm -hmm. the inherent divine. So they say all things are of God, you know, finally. You know, um, they say you can make anything holy, but you can deny the divine in anything. And say that again. You can make or you can't make? You can't make anything holy. It already is but you can deny the inherent divinity in anyone or anything. And that simply means the fact that this is how they explain it. They say there is one note sung in the entire universe. That's, they call that, you know, source. Sometimes they call it the word, which they call the action of the creator. And that one note sung is playing out as everything that we see and experience, seen and unseen, it is all things. It is the source that creates, you know, the tea kettle and the fire and the, the tea itself, you know, it's the one thing. So reclaiming source energy is restoration. You know, it's not an idea of a God that's there to fix things. It's just really understanding the universality of source which is operating in a higher way. So when they say we're operating in a dense field, we're operating in a, in, a, in, a, in a low octave, that's all. It's our octave. It's what we've chosen to incarnate in and experience life through. And I think that's great. We chose it. I chose it. You chose it. But that, you know, we also have availability to operate in the higher. And that's what their teaching is. And really, if you think of it as, as transposition, it gets easier. Right. They're saying any song can be sung in a higher octave. That's all. You know, and they're just lifting us that way. And then any, technically, the whole thing can be elevated is what you're saying. Absolutely and right. the new that's teachings. So obviously you're realizing Paul is incredible, right? Um, so if you happen to be listening to this on our premiere day, if you were listening to this on the Friday when this episode comes out, tomorrow, yes, tomorrow in Los Angeles, he is doing a workshop. The whole thing is channeled. He will be channeling. So it's incredible. So Saturday, February 4th from 10 to 4. So go to the link in the description, click on it, use the code DEN, capital D-E-N, and you will get $25 off to this event. He's amazing. Go, run. If you can do it, do it. It's so interesting where my head went when you were talking about that, when you were saying, you know, you can't make something holy because it already is, but you can deny its holiness, hence the separation we live in. I was just like, God, it's just such human nature. It's like the most simple thing is no action, right? It's what we want, is it to be simple, which would be just know what we all are. But instead we do the harder thing, which is the action of denying. Like we actually take the action of denying, which then separates us. And it's so, it's just fascinating that 
the hard thing is to get to the simple thing. Yeah, for me, it is. I mean, I guess real for me hard. too. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I don't know. Maybe it's it's simpler than I think, and and that I may that I make it. You know, the claim that they work with a lot in the newest book is they is the claim God is, God is, God is. Yep. And they say what that does is that refutes the denial of the divine. And again, it's not spraying perfume in the stinky room. You know, it's not masking something. It's not whitewashing injustice. It's not doing any of those things. But it is realization of omnipresence where it has been most denied, that that's what reclaims the world. And that isn't done through effort. I mean, I've moved to a place in some ways in my life now, and in most areas, not all. And I forget this sometimes, you know, when I have a bumpy week. Um, but I found myself in this funny place where what my needs were were being met before I asked. And I was like, my God, this is getting trippy. You know, it's like I go, hmm, I should go to a dermatologist and have this looked at. And the next day, the phone rings and it's a dermatologist's office saying, you requested an appointment with us three years ago. We lost your card. Would you like an appointment next week? Like, That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, I know. I'm going, this is getting trippy. But it was a real need and it was met. I don't know if that means that my desires are all being met because some of my desires are still kind of held in a bias of what I should have. Right. You know, I should have you know, the man of my dreams, I should have, maybe I will, you know, maybe it works that way too. But I found that when I'm allowing, when I'm letting, you can say, letting God be God, you know, and I'm not demanding, because in some ways they say, when I'm demanding things, I'm affirming the lack of them, which makes it much harder yes. to deliver. Um, you know, I can, I can be met. So I'm having that experience. And it's a funny thing, because when they talk about manifestation, they're talking about everything. You know, you think it's about manifesting the right person, the right house, the right career, whatever. But, but it's, it's everything it's that you're creation. Yeah, constant creation. Everything you see, you're in coherence with, tonal vibration, vibrational agreement with. That's it. And all of us, too. I think where the guides may differ a little bit, and I don't know other channel stuff. You know, I read half a Seth book, which I thought was great when I was a grad student. Um, but I don't seek out other work. You know, it's, most, most, it's either laziness on my part or just trying to keep it clean so that I'm not. There's no zeitgeist in and I think from what they're talking about. I don't think they've ever talked about I don't think they've ever talked about the fifth dimension through me, but maybe that's what the upper room is. I don't know. I was gonna not. ask you, is that how other people refer to it? Like but keep it going. Be, but it's it becomes jargon and language. They don't speak about science because they say or they don't use the language of science, they use the language of music because they say so, you know, our language, our science is gonna be outdated so rapidly. You know what we think things are and how mm. they're put together is going to be is going to be altered. But I was saying something else that you asked. But I was on a tangent. I forget what I was talking about. Well, we were talking about kind of when you ask for things and the purity of yeah. like how you ask for them, and then and then yeah. we talked about what we were. Talking, I was like, and then we I moved. I went off. It was, I, I went off on a on a on a tangent. On a oh, and you were saying how for you, like your desires are being met without you know once you let God be God. Yeah, but a lot of what we desire and I desire is still based in this template of what I can have or should have. The guides say, you know, we're always ordering off of the menu of what we think we can get. It doesn't occur to us to go beyond that. And it doesn't occur to me sometimes that source, whatever that is, actually knows what my real needs are, that it doesn't have to be demanded. You know, I don't have to say, give me what I want now. I wanted a steak and I'm getting this shrimp. You know, I, doesn't, I don't think that's necessarily going to change things. But this other experience is new and it's what they're talking about. Oh, I remember that everything is manifestation. That's what it was. Oh, right. And we were saying all creation. Yeah. All creation. So we're in, co oh, this is what I was going to say. 
So some of the new age stuff says, you know, you're the only one creating. So why did you create your cancer? Well, no, please. I don't know that I go there. Because if you're living in a town where they're poisoning the water and everybody's getting sick, you're in coherence with living in a town, which means you're living in a system that supports people dumping chemicals in the water. So there's another thing. There's collective agreement, too. Mm -hmm. And we're also party to collective agreement, which is, you know, we call a tree a tree and our idea of the color blue is blue, you know, and we're we're codifying reality through common language, common field. And when they work and they teach, they're actually working with a kind of restoration to source energy, which actually goes beyond language. You know, I am now of the belief that true knowing when you really know something is not coming in language. You just know it and then you give it language. Clear cognizance, we we attach language to things. But when I've known things in the past, I've just known them. It's not been an intellectual knowing at all. And then I will often translate it to language. When I step into somebody and feel what it feels like to be there, I give it language. And then maybe I'll start to hear an aspect of them. But I also realize that if I'm tuning into somebody who doesn't speak English, you know, somebody, you know, sometimes I have clients and their parents live in China, don't speak, I don't speak Mandarin. So I tune into the parents, but I'm still hearing them. But the, the information's being translated. The guides say, you know, they're working in tone and frequency that is then translated. Into we language. translate. Exactly. Yeah. So it's interesting, the more you talk, it goes back to that idea of what the guide said. This is material that needs to be digested through experience, not through the mind. Mm-hmm. Because when yeah. you're because when you're talking about even asking and praying, and I wanted to chat about that a little bit, because I found mm-hmm. that such an interesting section too, of really like paying attention to how you are requesting or asking. Because one of the things they said, which I found such an interesting way, descriptor, talking about words, where they said God equals, I got to find it because I know I'm going to butcher it. And it was, I found just an interesting way of describing it, but it's talking, God is supply source. Yeah, that's it. Which on face value, you're like, what? That feels so base and not, I don't know. It doesn't feel, I don't know. But then it's amazing when you think about it that way. And it's like, but how are you taking the true vibration of what you're asking for? Because like you said, you can say sending prayers, but if it's really not being prayed for, if you're really not, you know, doing it, it, it's an incoherence. It's not the same thing. So it's the same thing when you're asking for something, but it's like, you're not at the vibration. And they're saying simply, like, if you can get to that vibration, the supply is there. Yeah, I get that. I, that's what I believe. It was my experience, though, too, you know, and the areas where I expect now or agree, which is a better word, agreement being coherence, bounty or supply. I, I met the areas where I perceive lack, you know, um, are the areas where I'm constricting flow. And then that becomes my experience. The guides have said we're always getting what we expect like it or not, you know, we're always in agreement to what we're experiencing. And I, I, I don't know, I mean, we could go down a rabbit hole with that one, I suppose. But I, in my own experience, I think it's somewhat true, you know, and it's, it's a teaching of vibrational accord. And they say A-C-C-O-R-D, um, you know, or A-C-H-O-R-D as if on a piano. Mm. So it's tonality, is vibrational accord. So I don't know, you know, it's, um, but the, the idea of source is an easy one. It's, and that's basic metaphysics. I think I don't, the guides, and I think all of this stuff, I think this is probably a mystical teaching and it's probably been in other forms. Occasionally somebody will say to me, have you read, you know, so-and-so Meister Eckhart. I remember once channeling something. I was at the Esalen Institute and I was co-teaching with Jeffrey Kripal, who was running the religious studies department at Rice University, who was a scholar on Gnosticism, and he was really interested in the guide's work. And I remember being totally confused by something that the guides had said in the book that he was writing the introduction to, Book of Mastery. And they said, you know, 
they, they channel and they say, so they say something like, um, oh God, I'm not going to remember. Oh, everything is, nothing is real. They said, nothing is real. I said, okay, well, I've heard that before. That's okay. Right. And the next day they said, and here's the teaching for today. Everything is real. And I went, oh my God, they just contradicted themselves. What am I going to do? And then they unpacked it. But Jeff said, oh yeah, that's Meister Eckhart. He was talking about that back in whatever century he was teaching the, the mystic monk, you know? So this stuff is, is present anyway. I learned the teaching of abundance when I was near homeless, really. And I was very, very poor when I was in my late 20s. I mean, you know, I might, for me, it was a rough, rough time. But I learned the teachings of abundance. Um, and they took, and it took time, but they took. And I think you do build these things into consciousness. And I remember, you know, you know, I, I mean, I remember thinking at one point, you know, that I, Louise Hay, you know, the, the teacher used to say, bless your bills. Mm -hmm. And who wants to bless their bills? But you're not blessing the bills. You're blessing your ability to pay them. You're blessing that you're in flow with that. And my old therapist, Hurricane Harriet, way back when, <laughs> she used to say, God is source. God is source. And she was a tough broad with smoked 120 cigarettes, you know, and had like a blonde bleach, bleach blonde hair. She was great. <laughs> but she was a tough broad, but she had she had a spiritual side that was fierce, which I really admired and, and benefited from. And I was seeing her when I probably had 45 cents to my name. I think I paid 30 bucks a session for therapy, you know, back then. So and I but I learned that one, you know, and then it, your experience begins to change. But I often think we don't know that we're allowed. And I think there's a difference between mm -hmm. the personality self feeling entitled. I should have the best table in the restaurant. Don't they know who I am? Which is self-serving. And the difference between, you know, you have a right to be. You were born. You have a right to be. And this idea that I believe in that nobody's better than anybody else, which is, again, a, a cultural construct of how we give value to people based on things that are basically transitory. People love you when you're doing well. They don't love you so well when you're not. I used to say know? that in my old business because when I worked in entertainment, our jobs were so transitory. Yeah. And people would always be like, ooh, how are you excited about this job? I'm like, it's a rented chair. Like, it's a rented yeah. chair. <laughs> And to pretend it's not is foolish. Completely agree. And that's when you go to this idea of what is true is always true, you know. And if you go to source or the idea of source and you understand that, that so, you know, any a job is conduit for source. If you think that your, your relationship is the source of your love, you may be in for some tremendous pain. But you may experience love through the relationship, but it's not the source of it. You know, my self-esteem cannot be born in my physical well-being because that may not always be there, you know. It's, um, and I think these all become opportunities to know ourselves in deeper ways. That's all. You know, I don't think that any of this is negative. I just think it's not getting caught up in the stuff right. that we attach. But I think source comes in all different ways. And when I can remember that, my needs are actually met. So did you bless your bills? Yeah, I did. I did. And I also did this other little exercise, which not, is not, was not my guides. But they would say, go into the stores that you can't afford to go into and get comfortable there. And I remember hmm. going into ABC in New York and wandering around thinking I didn't have the right to be there. And I did, I mean, I really probably had 20 bucks at that time in my life. I'm not exaggerating. Um, and those years were challenging as can be. And then, you know, and then, you know, by the time I left New York, I mean, I was buying my furniture there if I wanted to. I didn't have to, but I could. I wouldn't go when I was very, very heavy, and I was for, for a number of years. There are stores I wouldn't go into. I mean, God forbid I should go into Lululemon and get sent back out <laughs> the front door. I remember going in once and we have nothing in your size, sir. Thank you for coming. And I went, oh, dear. You know, maybe you have to 
beat the store so I don't get in trouble. But it was, you know, normal. But, you know, then I began to say, you know, it exists. It's possible. If it exists, it's a possibility. And the guides say none of us claim anything until it's first seen as a possibility. We won't do it. I was going to say, I feel like your guides do do this teaching, just maybe not as specifically, because it is like, did you go? So do you remember going to ABC in New York and going from the one you didn't belong to actually walking through before you had the money and changing that vibration? Well, what I had to do was get comfortable. I had to know that I had a right to be there. I didn't know that I had a right to be there. I had the same thing I had with the gym. You know, they're not going to let me in the gym. It's a, you know those little uh, amusement park rides? Unless you're so tall, you can't ride on this. And I was thinking, well, once you're so big, unless you're so small, you can't, mm. you know, get onto the, the treadmill. Which, of course, wasn't true. But that was my experience of myself. And so all of this stuff, all of it, all of it, all of it has, has been experiential for me. It's, that's how it's happened, and that's how I've begun to trust it. But am I done? No. Do I still have baggage? Yeah. But I think it's less than it used to be, and I'm, I'm really super grateful for that. Uh, because, I, you know, it's like I said, there's a kind of relief now. You know, that may not always be there, but for the most part, it's around. And I'm grateful for the friends that I have and the work that I have and the body that I have and, you know, where I live and all those things. You know, and that wasn't always the case. You know, it was hard. You know, in the book, they, you got to, you interrupted them at one point and you were talking about, you know, believing, you're like, what about the lies that make me comfortable and like the relationships I believed should have worked. And, and mm. then they, you know, they, they did, uh, you know, I, I, I don't have another words for it, but like they did a tone and then did the thing. Did oh, that yeah. shift it for you? Like, did you feel different after that? I remember. Truthfully. Cause you're channeling. No. And they do this toning a lot, you know, now not as not, fortunately not too much, but when they tone, what they're doing is they're, it's singing really at a, at a pitch that they say allows for energy to move. And when they're doing a dictation in the book, it's interesting. They're shifting the reader as well. I mean, they say the tone is informing the text and people are doing the audio books. I mean, and you know, that I've been told they have to pull over to the side of the road when I start to tone because it's just a little, it's a little much energetically. And also the sound is startling. So did it change? I don't know. I don't remember what they were, what I was complaining about that they were attempting to address when they did <laughs> or it was something. Do you remember, they were also saying there was like an activity you guys did of looking in the mirror and they said, look at what you, they're like, take a moment. And was it real? I couldn't tell if you guys were really doing it or going back. You don't even remember. I don't remember. But if, if, if it's in the book, I wasn't doing it because I, when I'm channeling, I, most of the book was done, I believe this is Resurrection. It was done in front of live audiences. Right. No, no, yeah. Yes, so questions. I wouldn't have been before a mirror. I would have been in a chair with my eyes closed. What's the guide's advice? I'm curious because they say they're right off the bat early in the book. It says you must never be the arbiter of who learns what and what they should learn. And so reading that as a parent, I'm like, I grapple with this all the time with the work I do because I'm like, okay, if you're really listening to these, to all of anything, technically you should just kind of let your kids just, just run wild in a weird way. You're like, it's just, and it's like, but yet you're trying, I don't know. It's like, what is the balance as a parent that obviously you want them to have their own life and make their own mistakes and like, you know, make their own choices, but They've no, they basically have they've said that if you have someone in your care and you're responsible for their well being, you need to hold that responsibility. You know, that that they have said. So I don't think they're necessarily talking about how you raise your kids. Um I I think that there can be a tendency in spiritual culture for people to say, this is what you should be doing. And this is what you should know, because this is who I am. And I am not comfortable with that. 
you know, the guides don't tell me what to do. They honor free will. I'll get a strong suggestion sometimes. I, I, and I, I used to say this, you know, if I want to cross into traffic, if I want to walk into traffic, they're going to let me. If I, if I ask and I say, is this a time to, good time to cross the street? I probably will hear not wise, which means I'm not going to like what happens. If I do it, it's going to be hard. And I tend to listen to that stuff. Um, and I'm appreciative of it. But I, I you know, I, they don't tell me what to do. They show up when it's agreed to that this is going to happen and they're going to teach. And that's the arrangement. And I believe that they're supporting me in ways that I don't know and see. Not necessarily as my personal guides, but as teachers who are supporting growth. So I don't know. I don't know if I'm answering this um, or not. No, but I get your point, which I agree full heartedly is like, there's no one way to do anything. And mm-hmm. I mean, again, and they start the book kind of saying that too, with this collective shift of it's also, you know, any structure that has that hierarchy that you were referring to, whether it be religion or anything like that's what is going to start shifting because there is no hierarchy. Like you were saying, no one person is better than the other. And they alluded even to like, I mean, I kind of wrote down like the guru complex. That's been my big thing. I always say in religion, like, I mean, in spirituality, like walk the other way. If someone's telling you I have the answers and if you do this, Mm -hmm. your life is better. And if you don't, you're fucked. Like I'm always like, run. (laughs) Run in the other direction. It's happened to me too. I learned the hard way. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, and I'm, I'm very wary of that, you know, I mean, also I'll say this, I don't always talk about this, but you know, I, I ended up on Maui when New York shut down, the city shut down when I was working in Costa Rica. And I had a friend here who had been trying to get me to visit. And I had always been finding reasons not to go. So I, you know, it was far and a lot of reasons. But anyway, I ended up connecting with Ram Dass's satsang here, the community that supported him. And, uh, you know, and I didn't know his work well. at all, really. I think I had read Be Here Now when I was, or something when I was a bit younger, but I I didn't follow him. And I have to say, you know, there was an enormous amount of integrity in those teachings from what I've learned since. Enormous. And also a great lack of ego, which I am in real respect of. And I am highly, highly cautious around sort of the parade of, you know, look at me energy in spirituality, which is, and maybe I'm just an old guy now and I'm a curmudgeon. And when I was, you know, 25 and bought my first crystal or whatever it was, you know, it was like, oh my God, magic, you know, I was exciting and, you know, and, and eventually I think we settle into an awareness I mean, I had to get over the fact that people were going to think I was full of crap at a certain point, you know, that this was, I can get over it. It's not, I mean, I just show up and I do my work and I can't control what people think. And I I don't try anymore. You know, I've got a body of work behind me and it is what it is. And I am who I am, but I don't want followers. You know, that's not the purpose of the teaching, the guide's teaching ultimately is to bring people back to their own self inherent divinity. Yeah, that's it. I was going to say, how do you deal with the opposite? Not the, you know, believing in you, but how do you do deal with the people who feel like you have all the answers? I don't, I don't want the projection. I don't want it. I don't need it. I don't want it. Um, I understand. I, I don't like being public much. You know, it's, I'm, I'm basically an introvert and, uh, but I was a teacher and a classroom teacher for 25 years. And I got used to sitting in front of a group of people and talking and I loved it and I was good at it. I enjoyed that part of my life very, very much. But, uh, you know, I I don't, I don't because you get the positive projections and the negative projections. And I'm pleased if people are helped by the work. I, I'm genuinely pleased, but I'm not the author of the damn books. You know, that's just it. 
you know, I close my eyes and I talk. But I will say that you are still a teacher. Yeah, I am, but they're better than I am by a lot, you know, because they don't have the investment. I think that I do. I think about this all the time, though, whenever we talk. Every time we talk, I have the same thought where I'm like, it is amazing because obviously they're channeling through you. And you even say, I remember, I forget what the percentage you said, 30%. Yeah. Yeah. Some, yeah, you're like, I, I only remember this, but you have this ability to talk about the material in such a beautiful way. That is what a teach a good teacher, not, I shouldn't say a teacher, what a good yeah. teacher can do. Um, and I think about it every single time. I'm like, it's always amazing how you, how even for what you remember of what you do, how you know how to assimilate it, retain it, and then teach it again. Well, I'm in pro I'm, I'm, I'm a work in progress. I haven't arrived. You know, I don't say that I've ascended. My opinion tends to be the people that announce themselves as having ascended probably aren't because if you are, there's no need to say it. You know what I mean? <laughs> just, same thing all the time. Yeah. Like, you know, just be, just show up. I, and I also, the specialness stuff around the spiritual stuff is also a little problematic. It's you know? very but, problematic. You know, and I, I used to say this when I first started teaching in New York City, and it was in my late twenties. One of my first jobs was in the New York City public schools, and they used to send me out to like artist and resident stuff, and and you know, the South Bronx when it was basically a, a leveled place, and then you know, in the eighties, and some of the people that I met teaching in those schools were the most remarkable people I'd ever met, and they were spiritual as can be. They just they didn't know what a chakra was. They could have cared less. <laughs> they were loving and compassionate people who felt called to support other people. And I, it was very, very, very humbling for me to see that. I mean, that's part of the reason I think that I did become a teacher was I, I was, you know, it's, I didn't even, I wasn't expecting to be a teacher at all. It just happened. And I'm grateful. Otherwise I would have been on the street. So I don't know. Um, what was that transition for you from that, like, very, how did that transition work, teaching? Into teaching or from teaching? Into. Into? I know we've talked about from before. Blue. Out of the blue. I mean, I was literally in some awful job, you know, maybe two, I mean, I was, you know, I was in early recovery. I was very poor. I didn't know what, which I had been a playwright. I couldn't write. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't see straight, you know. I was just lucky if I had money for Capellini for dinner, which is basically what I ate for years. But I got a call. Somebody had, somebody that I knew peripherally had had a, 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 te- a class that they couldn't teach. And they say, hey, do you want this class? And I did it, and I was terrified. And then I loved it. And a director that I had worked with had begun running a program in the public schools and asked me to do that. And, you know, I had a pedigree. I'd been to Yale. You know, I had credentials that would allow you to teach, but I didn't think of teaching as something that I would ever want. And it happened. And then it kept happening. And truthfully, I never went looking for for those gigs. They just showed up. But, you know, I also stayed at NYU for 25 years where I taught and I ran a graduate program in Vermont at Goddard College, an old hippie school that was supportive of me doing this work, which was amazing. You know, Goddard was part of my, my, my own evolution. Yeah. So, you know, that's how it happened. You're amazing. I love chatting with you. I'm so grateful for you. It's unbelievable. I know you're so humble. I know you'll have no response to that, but (laughs) it's one of the reasons I love you so much. Um, you're incredible. And thank you. Thank you for always, because I know it's a lot and it's, I know it can exhaust you sometimes too. So I really appreciate you taking the time and you guys stay tuned because he will do our personal practice. And Paul, I love always having you here and thank you. Thank you for having me. So now Paul's going to do his personal practice, which lucky for us, he is going to channel. So we will see what the guides have to say. So they're saying we would like to say several things. The idea of who you are, the idea of who you are is what is being altered now, is what is being altered now. The truth of who you are, the true identity you may hold, the true identity you may hold is actually more 
know is actually more available than you know if you wish to speak these words. If you wish to speak these words, they serve as attunements. They serve as attunements to a higher level, to a higher level of consciousness. If you can imagine yourself as a radio, if you can imagine yourself as a radio, always in broadcast, always in broadcast, we're teaching you to play a higher station. We are teaching you how to play a higher station through intonation, through intonation and spoken word and spoken word. Now, when you speak these words, now when you speak these words, you are speaking as the true self. You are speaking as the true self, or the aspect that knows the true, or the aspect of you that knows them to be true. The identity of the small self. The identity you hold as a small self has ways of identifying yourself. Has ways of identifying herself. I am a this or that. I am a this or that. I appear as this or that. I appear as this or that. The true self is the eternal self. The true self is the eternal self that abides in what we call the upper room. That abides in what we call the upper room or the manifest divine or the manifest divine that can be experienced that can be experienced while you hold a body in form while you hold a body in form in form the realization of this body the realization of this body or the altered state of expression or the altered state of expression claims a new world into being claims a new world into being because the divine is manifest through you because the divine as manifest through you is an agreement to all things of itself or is an agreement to all things as itself as itself in other words yes in other words yes god sees god god sees god or knows god or knows god and all it experiences in all it experiences because finally all things must be of god because finally all things must be of god or nothing can be at all or nothing can be at all the spoken phrases the spoken phrases or invocations are invocations and attunements and attunements. You are claiming truth by saying them. You are claiming truth by saying them. We will, the word. We will again begin with the attunement to the word as the, as the energy of the creator in action. In action. You may say this if you wish. You may say this if you wish. I am word through my body. Word, I am word. I am word through my vibration. Word, I am word. I am word through my knowing of myself as word. Word, I am word. And, I can say this wish. and now you may say these words if you wish. I know who I am in truth. I know what I am in truth. I know how I serve in truth. I am free. I am free. I am free. The aspect of, things. The aspect of you that claims these things knows who it is, knows who it is, identity, identity, what it is form, what it is form, and how it serves, and how it serves its own expression, its own expression. When you claim, I am free, I am free, I am free. When you claim, I am free, I am free, I am free, you are lifting to a level of vibration. You are lifting to a level of vibration where the unimpediment, where the unimpediment, the expression, the expression, and the actualization, and the actualization of the monad of the monad, or the monad or true self can be claimed, can be claimed experientially, experientially, and blind experientially. Underline experientially, if it's not experienced by you, if it is not experienced by you, it is supposition, it is supposition, and while that is only useful for a short period of time, and while it is only useful for a short period of time, it may allow you entry, it may allow you entry, it will not support your full growth, it will not support your full growth. <coughs> When you say these words, when you say these words, you're actually lifting the energy field. You're actually lifting the energetic field to a level of agreement, to a level of agreement, to what we call Christ consciousness, to what we call Christ consciousness, which is the divine self, which is the level of the divine self that is experienced here, that is experienced here. And this is the claim you may make. And this is the claim you may make. I am in the upper room. You may say this, yes. You may say this, yes. I'm in the upper room. I am in the upper room. I have come. I have come. I have come. The announcement I have come. The announcement I have come is the agreement to embody, is the agreement to embody at this level of tone of vibration, at this level of tone or vibration. It accelerates process. It accelerates process. It moves what has been hidden to darkness. It is move it moves what has been hidden from bar from darkness to light and claims you an identity and claims you an identity will be in fruition that will be in fruition. We'll support you in this if you wish. We will support you in this if you wish. 
fish. If you work with the claim, I know I am. If you work with the claim, I know who I am. I know what I am. I know what I am. I know how I serve. I know how I serve. You'll be met by us in vibration. You will be met by us in vibration. Thank you each for your presence. Thank you each for your presence. Stop now, please. Stop now, please.